Hello, everyone, and welcome to the actual official webinar, uh, lecture number two in our short course series on practical AI for non-coders, uh, building task-specific AI as a topic for today. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night to everybody uh, all around the world. Uh, we are, uh, as usual, from IT Masters and Charles Sturt University. Uh, we are broadcasting to you live or slightly delayed, depending on whether you're watching this back later, uh, from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Uh, and IT Masters will like to pay our respects to their elders and ancestors and acknowledge their ongoing connection to land, waters and culture. Tonight or today, depending on where you are, uh, we are going to be joined once again by the wonderful Luca Ewington Pitsos. Hello. Uh, hello, Luca. Um, my name is Jack. Uh, I will be your MC for today. And we also have the wonderful Lily Nguyen, uh, who is in the background making sure that everything runs smoothly. Uh, just before we get properly started, a little bit of uh, housekeeping. And that housekeeping is... Uh, that you are able to access the recordings of this week's, next week's, last week's, every week's uh, uh, webinars at learn.itmasters.edu.au. And that is where you are also able to uh, engage with your fellow students and with Luca for uh, discussions on any of the topics that come up tonight. We most likely won't be able to um, uh, account for all of the questions that we are going to get, especially because there is quite a large number of people and it's a very interesting topic. So if your question is not answered, we do apologize, uh, but you can take that to the forums, learn.itmasters.edu.au uh, and chat about it to your heart's content. Um, speaking of chatting, if you'd like to send a message to uh, that's visible to all other participants, um, if you've got just comments or general kind of, um, you know, observations, on the course material, please pop that in the chat section, more slightly to the left of your uh, of the bottom of your Zoom window. Uh, if you've got direct questions for Luca that are about the course material specifically, uh, please direct those to the Q and A section. Um, again, we won't have time to answer every single question, but we're going to try and get a good cross section when we have the opportunity. Uh, and as usual. Um, I will stop talking now and take it away. <laughs> <Luca. Thanks. laughs> Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Um, my name is Luca. You may know me from the first lecture. Um, I'm a data scientist working in Melbourne. I've run startups in the past. Um, I've been doing AI stuff, you know, professionally for the last six years. So I've learned a thing or two. And I'm also like very self-taught. So I feel like I'm sort of in connection with all of you out there all of us out there who haven't done fancy university degrees. So that's kind of my vibe. That's where I'm coming from. And hopefully this will be a useful lecture series. Um, and actually, I think I'll, I'll backtrack a little bit because I have done a university degree and I'm sure a lot of you have also done university degrees, but not technical ones, probably. So why let the technical people have all the fun? That's the question. That's the question we have to ask ourselves in this, the second lecture, lecture number two, building task specific AI. So we're gonna we're gonna try to blaze through this one. So you're gonna have to switch your heads on. Okay, there's gonna be a lot of knowledge coming at you pretty fast. You're gonna have to catch it. So you know, uh, concentrate. <laughs> so the outline for this, uh, the course objective is that anyone who takes this course seriously will, at the end of it, be able to understand enough about AI to be dangerous. That's sort of a something that the the founder of Instagram used to say a lot. He said, I can't code that well, but I, I know enough to be dangerous. And that's the idea here. We want to learn enough about AI to be dangerous without actually having to know all the nitty gritty. That's the plan. So it is the end of this. You'll be able to think of a particular task. You'll be able to work out if AI can do it and also what kind of resources will be required to build an AI that could do it. That's the objective. Um, yeah, and, and the idea is that we don't have to go, we don't have to know everything to be able to know that, We're trying to learn enough to be dangerous. Okay, so the overview for this lecture is firstly, we're gonna go over some terminology. There was a lot of questions about ML versus deep learning versus AI. And I wanna really square those off at the beginning of this course, this lecture, so that no one 
is confused in the future. Next, we're gonna talk about how to train artificial intelligences. We're gonna recap the three-part model, which hopefully you remember, but if you don't, there's a recap. And then we're gonna talk about how training biological intelligences is a bit like training artificial intelligences. It's actually a very good analogy. It'll, it'll be very helpful in the next two lectures, which are also gonna be very, they're gonna be a bit harder than this, yeah. Okay, and lastly, we're gonna start the process of designing an artificially intelligent door lock system, um, which will be, it'll be a, a system that only opens doors for, for redhead people and, and locks the doors for everyone else. So I wouldn't be allowed in. Maybe some of you in the audience would be allowed in. I don't know. I would be allowed in. You would. Right. Okay. This is, <laughs> this is specifically for Jack. We're building this technology for Jack and their associates. You Thank you. I of... lose my keys a lot. So that would really help. <laughs> there we go. We're doing this for Jack. We're doing this for Jack. Um, so we're going to describe the task in enough detail to understand what's going on. We're going to apply our three-part model to the task. We're going to choose an architecture and then we're going to create some success criteria. Okay. So that's what we're going to do this time. We're going to blaze through it. Especially the coolest part of this is the biological intelligences bit. So definitely stick around for that. Stick around for the whole thing, but especially that. Okay. Terminology. So last time we talked about what AI is, and there were many people who gave fancy definitions, and there was many good definitions. But basically, the two things that a thing has to be to be an artificial intelligence is it has to be artificial, and it has to be intelligent. And if it fulfills those criteria, then you've got yourself an artificial intelligence. The issue, of course, is that intelligence is a bit of a wishy-washy word. And the sad, cold, hard truth is that no one knows what intelligence is. So because intelligence is wishy-washy, artificial intelligence is also a bit of a broad, wishy-washy term. You're not going to be able to pin down precisely. Um, and in addition, people are using it to try to make money out of the term. So they're applying it to funny things. So artificial intelligence, pretty broad term, um, but it means things that are both artificial and intelligent. Um, so for instance, yeah, actually, you know what? We'll, we'll, we'll get to some examples later. Then there's this question that again kept coming up. And I think you'll find a lot of diagrams like this on the internet. I've made my own diagram. Okay, so this is another one. Um, the difference between artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning, because often these three are used interchangeably in sort of a confusing manner. So I, I thought the main thing that I wanted to contribute here is some very good examples that sort of allow us to find the delineations between these three concepts. So artificial intelligence, we just went through that. It's a system that exhibits intelligent behavior. Machine learning is a little bit harder to explain, but it's also a little bit more concrete. And so very, in a very broad, in a very broad sense, what it refers to is systems that make decisions based on data, prior information, as opposed to on rules, hard and fast rules. And this is not something that's super easy to understand unless you've been specifically trained in this. So I'm gonna show you an example, a very simple example of a machine learning algorithm. Let's say that we wanna predict the weather tomorrow, right? We've got the weather from the last four days, we want to predict the weather tomorrow, which is day five here. As you can see, I've, I've labeled the days. There's two day twos, but you can ignore that. <laughs> so we have these four days, four different temperatures. We want to predict the next temperature. How could we do that? Have a think. Have a think for a little bit um, about how we could achieve that. There are many, there are a few ways. There are a few ways we could make estimations. We could ask people, you know, we could look at the weather report. One other thing we could do is we could just assume that the next day is gonna be the average of the preceding four days. That's not gonna be a super close estimate. You know, the weather could be a lot warmer, a lot colder than this estimate, but it's probably gonna be like roughly in the same ballpark. And believe it or not, what we've done is we've just applied some machine learning principles right there. Because what we've done is we've created an algorithm 
to predict the next day of weather based on a bunch of preceding days. And the key to this algorithm is that it doesn't rely on a hard and fast rule out there to predict the weather. Like, you know, the weather is always, I don't know, it's 10, then 11, then 12, then 13 degrees or something like that. What we're doing is we're taking some past data and then making an inference based on the past data. And if the past data was different, our inference would also be different. So that's like, that's a machine learning principle right there. And even though it's very simple, this is a machine learning algorithm. I'll, I'll show you what I mean. Um, definition of machine learning. There's like lots of different definitions of machine learning, right? But if you, if, if you take a basic one, uh, blah, 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 systems that are able to learn without following explicit instructions by using algorithms and statistical models to analyze and draw inferences and patterns. So that's exactly what we're doing here, right? We're not using explicit rules. We're creating an algorithm that uses, that makes an inference based on past data. And basically it's discovering a pattern, which is that all the, all the temperatures are around roughly the same. Okay, so are there any questions about that? Because that's kind of a tricky concept, but it's one that will probably make it a lot easier for you to understand the discourse around machine learning. I don't think that there are any questions so far specifically about this. Mm. Um, Everyone is way too smart. Yes, obviously. Please continue. <laughs> Someone's, someone in the chat is pointing out my math is bad. So... My math is pretty bad. <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's just rounding down. I don't know exactly. Anyhow, um, the inference, so someone, someone in the chat did ask, what is the inference based on? That's Mariska. Um, and in this case, like we're making a bad assumption here. We're, you know, it's a good chance the weather will not be this. Uh, that will not be the average of the last four days. We don't have like a good reason to believe that that's how the weather's going to go, but it's at least going to give us something that's kind of in the ballpark. That's the idea. Okay, so this is machine learning. Like the opposite of this would be to, to always say that the weather's going to be 24 degrees or possibly to... <laughs> know. My cat is trying to get out. What? <laughs> but the opposite of this would be to have some hard and fast rule to determine what the weather is. You know, maybe it's always like the wind speed plus, I don't know, the, the I don't know, the, the amount of cloud plus something else. Um, the idea is use previous data to make the next inference. Okay, so that's machine learning. And anything that is a machine learning system is generally considered to be artificial intelligence, right? It's sort, of, it's sort of hard to think of a good example of something that is a machine learning system, but not artificially intelligent because all machine learning systems tend to exhibit intelligent behavior right? or behavior that's sort of verging on intelligent. Okay, so that's artificial intelligence and then there's machine learning and a really good way to differentiate the two, right? Artificial intelligence is like a, a superset. Machine learning is like a small set inside the set of things which are artificial intelligence. A really good way of knowing the difference is that a Roomba, which is, you know, one of those automatic vacuum cleaners that drives around the house automatically, seems like it's intelligent. Roombas seem like they're pretty smart and clever. But actually, the decisions they make aren't based on prior data. There's just some very simple if-then logic sitting inside the Roomba. Like if you hit a wall, turn 90 degrees. Or, you know, if you're stuck, turn 180 degrees. Or uh, there's also some tracking software to make sure that the Roomba knows all the ground that it's already covered and when it's covered. It. So the Roomba seems like kind of an intelligent thing. It seems like a thing that can navigate around the house and, and find all the dust. But actually, it doesn't use machine learning. It just uses a bunch of simple if-then statements. So remember that, right? Artificial intelligence, things that seem intelligent, like Roombas, Machine learning, it's things that use past data to uh, make inferences. Rubers don't do that. Okay, so we're gonna push on one more deep learning. 
is a very special kind of machine learning where we use a particular kind of technology called an artificial neural network, which you will have seen. It's one of these. It looks like this. So this is a very scary image. It's very frightening. And uh, you don't need to know much more than, than that it's a frightening thing and that you should be scared of it because it's very hard to understand. <laughs> um, but if you want to dive in a little bit, there's an excellent, fantastic demo which starts to show you how neural networks work. You know, they're, they're made of these multiple layers of different neurons that are connected to each other. And by, by sort of changing over time, the neurons form these cool patterns and allow complicated pieces of inference to be done. Uh, this is a really cool tool. If we have enough time, we're gonna go back and we're gonna, we're gonna go back and, and, and use this tool because it's excellent. Um, but you don't need to worry too much. It's just a very specific technology like, yeah, it's a very spe specific technology called a neural network. And if your system involves a neural network, then it's a deep learning system. And if it doesn't involve a neural network, then it's not a deep learning system. And that's, that's kind of the crux of it. In general, the big, the really big machine learning systems that are doing very complex, powerful computing, like ChatGPT or Tesla's autopilot or what's another powerful, uh, stable diffusion or DALI, those image generation ones, or Whisper, which takes your speech and then turns it into text or the translation modules like T5, Google's T5. Uh, sometimes you'll hear these words called transformers, transformers in neural networks, uh, large language models, their neural networks, all the big, very powerful machine learning applications, they're all deep learning. Almost all of them are. Okay. So that's artificial intelligence versus machine learning versus deep learning. Does anyone have any questions? Several people do, in fact, have some questions. Nice. Nice. Excellent. Very, first of all, um, just to start off the questions, I would like to address the spurious accusations of me being an AI. I am not an AI. <laughs> I'm a human woman. And I would like that to be clear and on the record. So thank you. Um, no, I'm not an AI. Um, <laughs> the question. It's exactly uh, what an AI would say. It is. I honest. know. And that's really the problem. <laughs> it's really the problem. Um I don't think the AIs have red hair. AIs certainly don't get sunburned this easily. It's fine. <laughs> um, so someone's asked, what does voice to text fall into? Which you've just spoken a little bit about whisper, but are there, I'm interested to know if there are a variety of different voice to text applications that might fall into different areas based on different kind of uh, capabilities that they have. And this person, Jade, uh, also wants to know if you say space or period or full stop, it's intelligent to know, it's intelligent enough to know you mean the character and not the words. Does that fall into AI or is that more machine learning? Okay. So I'll answer the second question first. It's, I, it's difficult to know exactly what technology is being used under the hood, but text, uh, voice to text algorithms are very complicated and it'd be very hard to make one without using machine learning, i.e. without relying on prior data. So we can be pretty damn confident that whatever algorithm you're thinking of, it uses um, machine learning. It probably also uses deep learning, which is to say it has an artificial neural network inside of it. So, uh, and I would also say that it, counts as AI because, um, because it's acting in a way that's kind of intelligent, you know, when it, when it differentiates between the period uh, that you mean and the word period. Um, yeah, and I guess this is a nice demonstration. Look, here's some, here's some online speech to text stuff. It, it seems to be doing pretty well. Yeah, uh, we could definitely spend more time looking at this afterwards. What was the first question? I've forgotten now. Uh, the first question was, uh, what does voice to text fall into, basically? I thought that was the second question. 
I think I just reiterated it because I made some comments oh. on it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So it depends what algorithm is running behind the hood. Almost certainly voice to text will be using some kind of neural network because it's, it's quite a complex thing. You need a big complex algorithm to run it. The data coming in is voice data, which is very rich data. When the data is rich and complicated, like a voice or an image, you usually need a neural, a neural net, an artificial neural network. When it's sort of simple, like, you know, numbers in a spreadsheet, then sometimes you don't need one. It's more likely not to be deep learning. And am, am I, can I ask you, uh, Jack? Yes. Do you get the distinction between deep learning, AI, and machine learning? I think I do, which is great because I'm coming into this after not being in the webinar last week. So I think it's, oh. yeah, it does seem to make a uh, nice, clear distinction. And I enjoyed the diagrams as well. So thank you. Um, we've got, oh, a, yeah, we've got a couple of, um, couple of questions, several questions that are essentially, is X deep learning? Is yeah. this deep learning? Um, let's, let's go through them. Let's go through them. Yeah. Is yeah. Siri deep learning? Oh, I'm actually not sure. So part of Siri would be um, recognizing your voice. It would be speech to text, which would probably almost certainly be deep learning. Um, I would say almost certainly deep learning, definitely machine learning, and definitely AI because Siri seems intelligent. I trust her. <laughs> I shouldn't, but I do. Um, another question along the same lines is any bot essentially an AI? I, uh, no, uh, that's too vague. I'm sorry. Please ask something else, kind sir or lady. Absolutely or fine. Uh, the next question that I'm going to go to is, um, is an expert system distinct from machine learning? Is it different from machine learning? An expert system. Distinct. An expert system. I'm afraid I is perhaps expert system is a technical term that I'm not familiar with. I'm okay. not sure what an expert system is. Oh, a computer program uses what well, it sounds like based on this definition, it does seem like that expert systems do use AI. <laughs> Just based on this definition, it seems like it. Although I've never come in contact with one before myself. Right. I also have never come in contact with one. Um, okay. We've got quite a number of, uh, oh, here's, a, here's an interesting one. Uh, is AI applicable to collective things where individually devices might follow simple rules, but collectively they might exhibit intelligent behavior? Right. So this is a term um, called emergence, which is where properties um, that we have a group of things where each individual doesn't have a certain property, but together they have a property in the example, of course, is like an ant's nest um, where like individually the ants can't work out where food is, but as a, as a, as a whole, they know exactly where the food is and they can go get it easily. So um, there is definitely some research into what's called swarm intelligence. But that's a very specialized field of artificial intelligence. Um, I, it's, it's very specialized at the moment. Maybe it's one of those things where in two years, it'll be like all the rage, just as GPT is all the rage right now. But, but um, I can't say I know too much about it, but it's very interesting reading. So definitely, if you're interested in that sort of emergence kind of stuff and AI, swarm intelligence is very, very fun to read up on. Great. Um, I think that we might, uh, move on to your next slide at this time. Okay. Nice. Good. So we're done with the terminology. Everyone's kind of on the same page and no one will ever ask ever a difference between AIL and deep learning. So that's, I'm glad that that's definitely going to happen. Okay. So moving on, we're now going to talk about how to train an artificial intelligence. And the first step to talking about that is a recap of the three-part model, which we talked about last time. And this is just a very, very general purpose thing that basically everyone in the industry uses. Whenever you're talking about an artificial intelligence system, the first thing you do, rather than dealing with it as a sort of big monolithic thing that doesn't make much sense, you break it up into its component parts. 
which are the inputs to the system, the architecture of the system, which processes the inputs and the output that comes out the other end. So, you know, we have some examples of this from last time, chat GPT, it takes in plain text. It processes that text on a cluster of huge machine learning models that are sitting on servers in the United States. That's the architecture. And then it gives you back some text. And we're just going to demonstrate that right now. And just again, as I'm using GPT, just uh, it's going to log in. I'm not going to do that, but you all know what GPT three is. Um, and the point is, you can explain its behavior using the three part model. Input is text, runs on huge models, output is text. Um, I just happen to know that it runs on huge models in the US. That's not something that's readily apparent. So that's, again, just three part model, right? You take a system, you break it down to the three part model, then you can deal with it easily. Okay. Another example is this keras.js, which is a great little demo website. Um, we, we went through this last time. We're going to go through it again because it's good practice. So I'm going to use it. I'm going to use this AI model, okay? And you're going to think about what the input is and what the output is. So I'm going to draw a line here. And then something came out there. So we start off with this blank image and it gives us no output. And then when I make a line like this, it starts giving us some kind of output. Okay, it looks like it thinks that's a four. Uh, and I'll give it a different input now, I'll change the input. Boop. Okay, now it thinks it's a seven and it thinks maybe it's a little bit of two. Uh, now I'll give it another input. Now it thinks it might be a three. How about now? Yeah, okay, now it's turned into an eight. Okay, so this is the system. This is the input, this is what's going in. And what's going in really is a black and white image. And I get to choose what the black and white image is. It's a black and white image of my choosing. And what comes out the other side is an indication of what digit I seem to be making. And it doesn't just give you one number, it gives you, it gives you all the numbers. And I guess it, it looks like it's kind of scoring each number, right? It's giving you a high score for one, and a low score for four, and a low score for eight. So it's kind of a bit of a complicated output. It's not just giving you one number, it's giving you like a sort of like it, what it, you know, what it thinks is the most likely. It's giving you like probabilities of all the numbers. Okay, so that's the input, that's the output. Um, the architecture in this case, again, it's often hard to find the architecture when you're looking at something, but in this case, it's a tiny model. And it's actually just running inside the browser, um, which don't worry about that. what that means exactly. The point is it's a very, very small, very quick, very efficient machine learning model that does this. OK, so that's a three-part model for this little Keras Minst.js. Um, and the output is its probabilities for each number. So this is the probability of 0, probability of 1, probability of 2, et cetera, et cetera. OK. Uh, Slideshow, sure. fantastic. And then just to sort of get us used to this three-part model again, another example of a machine learning algorithm is Tesla Autopilot, which we can watch a little bit of, but I think YouTube will, will kill us if we put any YouTube videos in this video. So I'll just talk about it, but if you want, you can definitely go watch that video, it's great. Um, the input for Tesla Autopilot are eight cameras sitting on the Tesla vehicle. And actually I think maybe it's more now, I don't know. It was back in my day. The architecture is a huge stack of different artificial neural networks. A huge arrayed in all these fancy, crazy ways. So a hugely complicated architecture made up of uh, multiple artificial neural networks, which are, that makes it a deep learning solution. And the output is a 2D map of the road. And then once we have this 2D map of the road, it's kind of easy to work out where to drive and where not to drive. So again, input, output, no, input, output, architecture. <laughs> Architecture's in the middle. And the input gets processed by the architecture 
and it spits out the output. So that is the three-part model. If you take away nothing else from this course, if, if you are involved in a, in a brainwashing cult and they make you forget everything, just hold on to this piece of information, okay? The three-part model, it's used all the time, it's ubiquitous. This is the kind of thing that gives you enough information to be dangerous with machine learning. But maybe don't be too dangerous because machine learning itself is quite dangerous. So yes. Okay. Yeah. Do we have any questions? I feel like this would be a great time for questions. We do have several questions. A decent number of them are continue to be, is this AI? <laughs> is this AI? And I would like to please ask people to hold their questions about if miscellaneous things are AI. I'm going to go ahead and say on go out on a limb and actually say that most of the answers are yes. Um, they seems... they they do seem to meet the meet the characteristics. It might not be very sophisticated, but it does seem to be AI. If it seems intelligent, or if it's doing something that like an intelligent animal could do or a human could do, then it's probably AI. That is that that is true. Um, well, actually, we've got a fair few more questions now, and I've become slightly uh, overwhelmed. Too many um, questions. Okay, so I'm going to just go ahead and ask this one because I honestly just really want to know your answer to oh. it. Margaret's asked, in the late 1980s, I was studying neuroscience. Go, Margaret. Yeah. Uh, and the lecturer spoke of AI and biochips. Are we there yet? AI and biochips. Um. Okay. I'm so sorry, but okay. I want to know. Um, the most interesting thing I can say about AI and biochips is there was this study. Uh, this is someone uh, who used to run uh, a meetup that I run. He was part of a team which taught brain cells in a Petri dish to play Pong. So they hooked up brain cells to uh, to a computer, right? With like electrodes. So like they had they have some meat that's sitting in a dish and it's got wires going into it and they taught it to play Pong. Now, I don't know if that, that's certainly some kind of intelligence. I guess that's not even artificial. That's like biological intelligence at that point. Um, so I don't know if that like directly answers the question, but certainly a lot of very cool cybernetic -y, intelligence -y things are happening. Cool. They're Thank also, you. They're also doing things like sticking electrodes inside people's brains so they can work out if they're going to have a hemorrhage or like read their brain waves and things like that. That's also very cool. Excellent. Uh, I've got another, I've got some possibly slightly more directly uh, pertinent questions. Uh, we've got, I'm going to ask two in one. So yeah. David's asked, David said, I'm finding the three-part model a bit facile. Basically, it's input, black box, output. Are there other models that are less generic? And Ben has asked, if you chain two models, output to input, is that one model or two? Okay. So first so of all, I suppose what what, what are the models? Uh, easy, a little bit uh, uh, too overly simple. Ooh, ooh, facile. Clearly, this, this person is very clever. <laughs> Thank you for teaching me this word. Um, okay, so the nice thing about the three-part model is that even on architectures that are very simple, like the, you know, the KS, KS mins.js, even on those very, very simple architectures, it applies. You know, you clearly have your input, you have your output, and you have your architecture. It also applies to mind-bendingly, mind-bogglingly, mind-collapsingly complex architectures like this one here with Tesla. The point is that it is applicable to basically all machine learning that is done, is you have these three components, input-output architecture. And, you know, if you actually want to be good and be technical and really build these things yourself, you have to understand the code and you have to understand the hardware, and you have to really understand what's going on here in the architecture, and you have to be very careful with the input, and you have to know how to measure the output correctly. You know, there is infinite levels of complexity that can be layered upon the three-part model, but we'd like to start with that 
or at least I like to start with that. And that's, that's what everyone that I know who works in the industry does as well, because this keeps us sane and it allows us to separate the complexity so that all the complexity doesn't roll together into one sort of ball, <laughs> if that makes any sense. Hopefully that answered the question. Um, I think that makes perfect sense. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jack. And the yes. second question was, what if you have two architectures, one next to the other? You know, how does that work? How does that fit into the three-part model? Well, this is a very good example. So in actuality, um, if you look at the Tesla architecture deeply, you have your eight cameras and they go into the first layer of the model. And that first layer feeds into like four more models, which each feed into each other. And then a, a, a sixth model, which then feeds into two more models and so on. Like you can see, there are like heads and trunks and there's a transformer and like three reg nets. Like there's all sorts of very complex models passing things into each other. Um, and for each of these models inside here, like each trunk, that is itself, you know, you can apply the three-part model to the trunk, for instance. Its input is whatever's coming out of this video queue, and its output is whatever's going to these heads. So you can kind of, you can kind of like nest the three-part model down and down and down and down. And that's often what we do. Um, yeah. So in answer to your question, uh, if there are two models inside one big model, then you can still apply the three-part model. Um, you know what? I'm actually going to Excalibur draw this one because this is a really important, this is kind of a cool question. Um, so whoever asked that question, I like you a lot. So this is your input. This is your model one. This is your model two. And this is your output, okay? Um, and you have these nice arrows going from one to the other. And of course the input is, you know, it's sort of like a different color because it's an input and the output is also this nice like different color. Okay, so you have input and let's make the models like a bit more kind of substantial. Okay, so you have the input and you have your two models and you have the output. Um, and we'll give them names. This is M1 and this is M2. I have to zoom in a bit there, that's, that's tiny. Um, so this is the specific scenario that the person was asking about here. Like, how does this fit into the three-part model? Well, you actually break it up. You say, there, there are actually, um, yeah. So when I draw the model, sorry, when I draw this arrow going from M1 into M2, what actually happens is some kind of data comes out of M1 and that data then flows into M2, right? It's not like they're two separate models, so they're not, they're not directly linked. They have sort of a thing in between them, right? Um, if one model is feeding into the other model, what means is that something is coming out of the first model and then going into the second model. So we have this sort of intermediary stage here. And that intermediary stage goes into M2. And from the perspective of M1, this intermediary stage is the output. And we have our three-part model for M1. It looks like this. And from the perspective of M2, this intermediary stage is the input. And again, we have our three-part model here, input, output, architecture. So even in a case like this, the, the three-part model always definitely applies. It's just that this intermediary stage is the input in one three-part model, and it's the output in the other three-part model. Yeah. Um, thank you for asking that question. I had a lot of fun talking about that question. I think it's a very important question to ask. I really enjoyed the diagrams. Um, just to follow on from that as well, actually, Please. Uh, Reese has also asked, in the three-part model, where would feedback most appropriately fit? As in, for it to be intelligent, it must recognize feedback and adjust slash learn slash adapt, right? Right. Okay. So this is talking about sort of the process of training. And, you know, I guess there's this other thing we do that um, uh, we build a model. So we, we train a model to make it good. We put it out there in the wild. And as 
And as more data comes in, we use more data to train the model to be even better. So we sort of have this like continuous training process. Um, how does that continuous training process where real world data keeps feeding into a model, how does that relate to the three-part model? Um, we don't have the tools to talk about that yet, but at the end of this lecture, we will, unfortunately. Um, I think fortunately. <laughs> I wish I could talk about it right now. How does this, how does the three-part model relate to models sort of becoming smarter over time? Well, okay, so very, very, I'm skipping ahead a little bit here, but very, very briefly, just between, between you and me, whoever asked the question. What we do when we train a model is we, we give it input and we see what output it gives us. And if it gives us the right output, we reward it. And if it gives us the wrong, out, the wrong output, we kind of punish it and make it change. So over time, the model becomes more and more like the kind of model that'll give us good output and, and less and less like a model that'll give us bad output. That's, that's kind of over time how it works. That's how training works. And through this process, models can get smarter and smarter and smarter as we give it more and more input and output. So I guess that's one example of how the three-part model is used to talk about uh, training models, and making them better. Yeah. Thank you very much. Shall we move on to the next uh, section? Yes, let's do it. And um, while I'm here, let me just plug Excalibur. It's really good. Use this program. It's lots, lots of fun. Um, okay, cool. So here we are. Uh, we have done the three-part model. We've done a recap. Now here's the fun bit, okay? This is the fun bit. We kind of just spoiled this a little bit, but this is where it gets really fun. So training an artificial intelligence is a lot like training a biological intelligence. Like, for example, a dog. Or, I don't know, maybe you have a spouse who doesn't do what you want. Similar. Similar stuff. <laughs> so, uh, that's, that's a joke. That's a joke. We, we treat other people with respect and honesty. But anyhow. Thank you. I just unmuted it. <laughs> I just <laughs> unmuted myself to uh, make sure that that was a joke. Thank yes, you. That was definitely a joke. Very much a joke. Um, uh, but, you know, if, if, your, if your spouse does something nice to you, you can reward them. You know, that's... <laughs> anyhow. This is how we train a dog to do something called targeting. Um, I'm just gonna play this video. Please let me know if you can hear it. And if you can't hear it, I'll stop playing it, okay? Can we hear this? I cannot hear this. Hmm, that's a big shame. Okay, but uh, I'm just gonna mute this for me then. And I'll just explain what's going on. He's teaching this dog to, to push its nose up against his hand, which is something called targeting. He's obviously a very advanced engineer here. And he's teaching it. So what he did is he, he introduced a stimulus. He put his hand out, right? He introduced a stimulus. The dog reacted to it. And when the dog produced the correct behavior, when the biological intelligence did the correct thing, he rewarded it. He gave it a reward. And the idea is that over time, this biological intelligence will learn to perform the same trick, the same behavior. And here he's doing it again. Oh, here we go. Isn't that nice? <laughs> okay, so that's kind of how you train a biological intelligence. That's how you train a biological intelligence. Um, you introduce a stimulus, so you make a fist near the dog, or in that case, he used his palm. And then, you reward good behavior. So if the dog does something good, if it puts its snout near the fist, then you reward it. And if it does anything else, you don't really reward it at all. And then you just sort of repeat these two steps and eventually the dog will um, learn the trick. So now I want you to think for a second, let's imagine that I told you that this was a very specially selected YouTube video. And this isn't actually a dog at all, this is actually a very advanced artificial intelligence sitting inside this sort of like furry chassis 
There's like a little computer in there. Just imagine for a second. So imagine this is an AI system and now we want to apply the three part model to that interaction here, to this sort of thing where we introduce a stimulus and then reward good behavior, right? We make a fist and then the dog does something. And if it does the right thing, then we, then we, then we give it a reward. So we can actually apply the three-part model. And hopefully some of you have maybe been thinking about, oh, how can we apply the three-part model? I'll ask a simple question. What's the architecture in this case? We is it, the, off, is sure it the dog? Knows. It's the dog. Yes. <laughs> the architecture dog put the, the mules. So the trick to if you meet a dog in the wild, you've never taught it this trick, fist out. Luca, I may need you to just, uh, so sorry, I might need to just repeat the last uh, few sentences because uh, it seems that the uh, audio was dropping out for most people um, ah. just after we confirmed that the architecture was in fact the dog. <laughs> okay, 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 cool. Okay, so the architecture is the dog, the input is the stimulus, the fist or the palm, and the output is what the dog does in response, so where it puts its snout. And you can imagine that if you approached a dog that had never learned this trick on, or didn't know about this trick, and you just put out your fist, it might sniff your fist or your palm, but it might also do anything. You know, it might look over to the left, it might look over to the right, it might see something and, and start chasing it. So if you, if you plotted, sort of looked down from the sky and plotted the location of the snout of the dog, um, when you put your fist out, it would just be going all over the place. And as you sort of reward the dog for going closer and closer to your fist with its snout, the plot gets sort of more and more centered around the area that you want it to center on. Um, and that, that is very, very similar to the process by which we train artificial intelligences. We do, we do basically the same thing where we'll, you know, for instance, let's even just talk about the Tesla thing for an example. At the beginning, this huge pile of deep learning models takes in this eight camera data and it'll start by just outputting random noise completely. And then over time, what we do is we reward the system when it gives us something that looks good and we punish it when it gives us something that looks bad. And slowly, slowly after many iterations, the machine learning model learns how to produce the correct output when it sees the correct input. You know, just in exactly the same way that over many, many repetitions of the trick, the dog will slowly learn how to do targeting correctly and how to put its snout on your palm correctly. Um, so that's a really good analogy to keep in your mind, right? Training artificial intelligences is a lot like training biological intelligences. Um, and in both cases, we follow this sort of simple process. We choose a task. In this case, we're teaching the dog how to do targeting. We work out the inputs and the outputs. Okay, input is the, where, you know, I make a, make a palm or I make a fist. And the output is the location of the dog's snout. That's the thing I'm trying to change. That's the thing I'm trying to get a good result of. And then you choose an architecture. And of course, in this case, you probably only have one dog that you're trying to train. But you can imagine, you know, you can imagine if someone was forcing you to do this, you know, you had to get this targeting trick working. There are some dogs that you would really want to choose and some dogs you'd probably try to avoid. You know, there are some architectures, some dog architectures that are very good for this kind of a task and some architectures that are very bad. I'd probably want to choose like a, like a German Shepherd or something. I'd probably be less likely to choose a Chihuahua, for instance. Um, and then you have to execute, which is like this, repetition. You have to repeat and repeat and repeat until the intelligence really understands what you're doing. And this is a very similar process with two more steps for training artificial intelligence. 
you choose a task, maybe it's self-drive, you know, uh, actually maybe it's uh, just the Keras.js one where you want it to take in, you want it to be able to predict digits correctly, hand-drawn digits. You choose a task, you work out what the input and the outputs are. Well, in this case, the input is uh, an image, black and white, and the output is a number. You choose an architecture. Um, in this case, they've chosen a very, very small, very efficient machine learning model as their architecture, a deep learning model. Um, and then there are these two more steps, which you don't usually do when you're training a dog or a cat or something, which is you have to clearly define some success criteria, uh, which they have to work out. If you, how do you know? If you have to work that out before you start training. Uh, uh, because any learning model is harder than training a dog or a cat because, because usually training a machine learning model can cost to be very and usually training on your next lecture. But again, at the last step, you have to do this execution where you again and you again and again, you expose the machine learning model for giving the correct output. Uh, Luca, I'm so sorry, but your audio is uh, is becoming quite choppy yeah. and Zoom is showing that you seem to have quite a bad connection. It might be worth potentially turning off mm. your video. Mm. Mm. Uh, I will, in that case, I will do that. Excellent. Um, how long has that been going on for? Uh, it's only happened twice, really. Uh, okay. This is This is much better, though, definitely. So thank um, you. I'm going to turn off the YouTube video. Maybe it'll help. Okay. Uh, that may well help as well. Yes. Okay. Uh, now is a very good time for questions, though. Fantastic. Well, we've got a lot of questions about what is the treat or what is the punishment for AI, <laughs> which is somewhat uh, been explained, I think, since several of those questions were asked. But I think it might be worth explaining uh, a little bit further. That is a very, very difficult question to answer, unfortunately. That's probably... that's pretty much the central thing about machine learning, but it's also the hardest to understand. It involves a lot of mathematics. Um, essentially, your machine learning model is a very complex pile of numbers that all feed into each other. Kind of like, you can imagine it like, a, like an ant's nest. And the idea is that when you put in something into your model and you get the right kind of output that looks good to you, you kind of tell the ant's nest, keep being like that. Be like that. Be similar to what you just were, except a bit more. And when it gives you an output that is bad and is wrong, you know, so with the Keras JS, if I drew a six and it told me it was a five, then you kind of stir up the ant's nest a little bit and say, no ant's nest, stop being like that. That's bad, be different. And the ant's nest changes a bit to be different to, to what it just was. And so over time, you because you're changing it, uh, whenever it does something correct, it, you change it to be a bit more correct. And whenever it does something bad, you change it to be make sure that it doesn't do that. Yeah, at least like talking about hundreds of thousands, you know, millions of, of attempts, it slowly becomes good and starts giving you the good output almost all the time. Positive reinforcement. Yes, yes, exactly. Except just a lot of reinforcement. So more is more in this case. Yes. Yes. Yeah, very much. Excellent. Uh, we do have another question, which I think is probably the most pressing question that we've had all evening, which is, can your cat do the trick? <laughs> um, it's not even my cat. It's my housemate's cat. And unfortunately, he is very stupid. <laughs> but we love him anyway. He's very, he's very nice. I understand. I... <laughs> 
to um stupid but nice no i'm i have a very stupid cat uh who's very soft um <laughs> oh is there an amount or how much data and algorithm is needed to get the exact 100 successful output and i'm actually going to add to that question is there such thing as a 100 exact successful output so you've asked the first question is a little easier you've asked a very hard one jack but i'll see what i can do feel so. free to skip my question <laughs> if necessary um it we can we do need to keep it to time it the answer to the set the first question is it depends so i've shown us three examples of machine learning models we've had a look at the keras.js which is this very simple you know you draw a little number and it guesses the number algorithm and we have say tesla right which has these eight cameras as input you know I don't know how many frames per second, probably 60 frames per second or something, going through this huge, massive These two need a different amount of data. Right? So Luca, here, your your you audio is like doing a... the thing again. I'm so sorry to interrupt. You no, might no, need to okay, okay. No, you no, might no, need no, to no. go uh, camera off. My bad. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I think I will share the screen. Cool. Cool. Anyhow. Um, yeah. Yeah. So when we think about Keras.js, the input is quite simple. And you can kind of see that there's sort of a finite number of black and white images like this that we have to deal with. And the model is very small. So like, if you show this model and train it, you know, on maybe like 100,000 images, maybe 60,000, maybe even 20,000 images, you might, that might be enough. You might have done enough because it's only a very small model. There are only so many configurations it can be in. And there are only, so many inputs, you can probably get almost 100% um, after only like 10,000 images or 10,000 training iterations where you give it a reward, 10,000 rewards. Whereas with this, this monolithic architecture that has to take in, look, nine cameras at a time. And those cameras can be any kind of scene that you could imagine on the road at all. Just any part of Google Maps could be coming at you at any point. And the output again, it's very hard. You're going to have to iterate. You're going to have to reward it millions, billions of times before it even starts producing something that makes sense. And then you're going to have to keep going and going and going until you get something that, you know, is good enough. So, how much do you have to reward it to make it good? Depends on how powerful the machine learning model actually is that you're dealing with. Smaller models doing simple tasks, uh, not so much maybe 10,000, 20,000 times, uh, huge, big, chunky models, billions of times. And um, Jack asked a really good question. Can you ever get a perfect output? That is a very academic and hard question. I'm actually, I can't deal with it. <laughs> but um, uh, okay, okay, okay. I'll, I'll show you, this is, this is very good food for thought, okay? This person has designed this algorithm so that it, it, it predicts digits pretty easily, right? But then what happens if I just draw something like this? It's thinking that this is maybe a six or an eight. It clearly isn't a six or an eight. So is this model, is this model failing here? Is this an example of the model not giving the correct output? Like who knows? Like who? Who knows, at this point, we're going into weird territory. You know, like, the question is, what does your model need to deal with? And the, yes, the question is like, what do you, how do you know if your model is perfect? The, the answer to that depends on what inputs your model needs to deal with and what your ideas about perfect are. It's an interesting question, though. All right, shall we continue on with the slideshow? Yes, let's continue on with the slideshow. 
Um, okay, so where we got up to is that uh, training a biological intelligence, artificial intelligence is a bit like training in biological intelligence. And you have these steps you have to follow, right? Choose a task, work out the inputs and outputs, choose the architecture, define some success criteria, which we'll talk about that in a second, locate training data, we'll talk about the next time, and then you execute, you actually perform the training, perform the rewards. Okay, now we're gonna talk about a simple task where we create an algorithm to um, act as an automatic door lock. So there are these four components here. You have a camera, which is looking at whatever's out the door. You have a computer where all the camera feed goes into. Let's say the camera is taking one picture per second. The computer then has control over an automatic lock and the computer can tell the lock to open or to close. So this is the system that we're dealing with. And I'll sort of, um, the issue that we have to solve with machine learning is we wanna make sure that this door only opens to people who have red hair. This is like the secret society of red hair people. Uh, it's been around for years and years, no one knows about it. And they're sick of having to hire someone to stand by the door. So we need to design this algorithm. And so the machine learning model in this case um, would need to be running on this computer and continually assess images coming in and then make a decision as to whether to lock the, lock the door or unlock the door. So going back to our steps here, the first thing we have to do is work out the inputs and the outputs, right? We've said what our task is. We need to only open this door if the person has red hair and definitely do open it then. So that's the task. What are the inputs and the outputs? Again, we're sort of running close to time, so I'll, I'll see how we go. But um, let's just think about the input. What's the input going to be in this case? Jack, do you have an inkling? Is it going to be the hair color that's detected? Uh, or red hair particularly? That, that is part of the input. So uh, yeah. Just a human's appearance. Yes. So the image that is coming from the camera is the input in this case. Um, because the, the camera takes a picture every second, and then you need a model that takes that image and then decides, is that image a red hair person? Yes or no? Confirmed. So yes, it is. <laughs> I wasn't yes. sure if you were asking me or not. I do resent the uh, <laughs> comparison to Ed Sheeran, but <laughs> neither here nor there. So, it is. So, yes. I, I was just trying to think of a red hair person. That was the first one I thought of. Um, yeah, I'm not saying he's represented. Anyhow, so we have the input, it's an image. This model will have to take in images, give an output of yes or no, red hair or no red hair. Okay, great. We've done the inputs and the outputs. We've got our two components, the three part model. Now we have to choose the architect. And oh, it says my internet connection is unstable. Is, is my internet connection back? We can hear you. Hello. Yep. Nice, fantastic. Okay, so whatever neural network, whatever algorithm can do, pretty similar to this, because Keras.js also took in an image and an assessment based on that image. And give an image with the assessments. So more a bit similar to this one, I would say. Okay. Now, actually learning how to choose the architecture is sort of a big thing, but what I will do is I'll go over um, what I would do to find an architecture that's appropriate for this. Essentially what I do, uh, and machine learning engineers, I guess data scientists like myself would do when choosing the model is you, you go on the internet and you find a benchmark that's related to your task. So our task is, well, it's sort of detecting faces, really, right? We need a model that's going to be pretty good at like face recognition. So there's this nice face recognition benchmark over here. Um, it's got this funny name, CFPFP. -FP. 
And these are all these academic papers that have been published against this benchmark, um, this face recognition benchmark. So all these academic papers have been trying to be very good at detecting faces. And they have these funny names like disk face and elastic face arc and QMAC face and ghost face VNet too. Um, and essentially what I do is I say, okay, you know, these are all built for detecting faces. I'm just gonna go and read the papers for all these, you know, for two or three of these guys and work out, you know, how easy is it gonna be for me to, to be able to build that myself. And then what I usually do is I go and visit the, the code. I look at the code and probably be using that code and sometimes the sound and just sort of plug and play. So you don't need to worry about all this stuff, but it's helpful to know what data scientists do. So when approaching a new task, we have to choose a model. And what we do is we find models that have been used for similar things before and pick them. So in this case, uh, I'm just sort of says, but, um, you know, there are these three models that I happen to know work pretty well on similar tasks, efficient net, there's one called mobile net for like very small computers, there's something called inception net, which is also very good. And because all these models and all the ones that were on the benchmark before, they all use artificial neural networks, I know that this is going to be a deep learning system. So here we have our three-part model, we have our image, and we're going to use efficient net and don't worry too much about what that is. It's a neural network. It's kind of, it's not too big. It's not too small. And out, out of this is going to come an output, which is red hair, yes or no. So we've come a long way towards training. And the next thing I wanted to talk about was how does it set up a success criteria? Um, but I think we're, we're basically out of time at this stage. So we're going to talk more about the training next time. But the main, I guess, just to recap, just very briefly, you know, training artificial intelligences is a lot like training biological intelligences. You model them in the same way. You present a stimulus, you feed it into the architecture, and then you reward the architecture for giving you a good behavior. And we're, we're trying to design a system which is sitting on a computer. It takes in images that are being taken in front of the front door. And uh, it outputs unlocking or locking the door. And we need to design an algorithm that will, um, that will do that correctly and do that well. And so far, we've just done the three-part model. And we've come up with what our inputs are going to be. The images, outputs are going to be a yes or no for unlocking the door, keeping it locked. And we're going to use efficient now. And we'll continue next week. <laughs> Thank you so much, Luca. And uh, my apologies, everybody, for the uh, timing. I was under the impression at the beginning of the webinar that it would go for 90 minutes and I set my timers uh, accordingly. So my apologies for the uh, slight air of chaos around it. Uh, thank you, everyone, for all of your questions as well. I know that there were a lot of questions that were not able to be answered and you will be able to ask those questions uh, and discuss amongst yourselves and with Luca uh, at learn.itmasters.edu.au. That is also where you will be able to find all of the webinar materials. So the slides, the videos, uh, any additional readings or resources which Luca wants to provide, as well as the discussion forums for every week of the webinar, of the short course. Uh, that's learn.itmasters.edu.au. Uh, thank you, everybody, once again. Uh, hopefully you had a wonderful time. I certainly did uh, and hope to see you back here, same time, same place, uh, next week, which is at uh, 7 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time uh, or, you know, it's equivalent where you are in the world, but that is 7 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time next Thursday. So thank you very much, Luca. Uh, looking forward to hearing more about practical AI for non-coders next week. And go Matildas. Um, also, <laughs> just just go sports. Go women's football. Uh, that's the extremely biased uh, 
conclusion from the IT Masters team. That's the official position of IT Masters PTY LTD. Um, thank you all very much. Have a lovely morning, afternoon, evening, or night. Oh, and thank you very much, Lily. Oh, my goodness. Thank you, Lily. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>